everybody. Welcome to Solicited Advice, the podcast where I get to do what I love most, give advice. And I thought, what better way to end out the season with just a super casual, loose, fun, quick little edition of Chef's Kiss. It's just me. It's just the caller. I'm answering your questions. We're going to get through as many as we can to keep this under an hour. We got to keep it tight. We got places to be. And I was like, this is a literal dream assignment because this is you know, kind of where the idea for this podcast came from. It came from Instagram and answering questions that way. And I do sort of miss just like the quick succession of we're answering the question, we're getting in, we're getting out, you know? And as a reminder, we are taking a break. This is the end of the season. This is it. So we will not be back next week. Hope you have a delicious holiday. Take some time for yourself. And uh, yeah, let's get, let's get started. Let's take some questions. Hi, Allison. My name is Michaela. I'm calling from Brooklyn, New York. I am a huge fan of your show and your recipes. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for answering my questions today. So my question is about cooking chicken. So I tend to have this, I guess you could say both rational and irrational fear of undercooking my chicken and giving myself or whoever I might be cooking for salmonella. So I tend to always tell myself when I'm cooking chicken, no matter in what form, whether I'm roasting it, cooking it on the stove, frying it, however it might be. Oh, let's just give it one or two more minutes. And then it always ends up being pretty dry and gross and not juicy and delicious like I would like it to be. So I guess my question for you would be, how do you know when your chicken is done? Thank you so much for answering my question. I really appreciate it. Okay. So I guess... First thing is I have been eating chicken a long time. I've been cooking chicken a long time. I've cooked it well. I've cooked it under. I've cooked it. I've touched stuff with raw chicken. I've never gotten anyone sick and I've never gotten sick myself. I don't know why Americans have such a fear of getting sick from chicken. I have gotten food poisoning a few times in my life, maybe two or three times in recent memory, like in the last 10, 15 years. And one of them was from like bad chicken. But I'm telling you, the chicken was like way overcooked. Like it was braised chicken, but it was like old. Either the chicken was old when it was cooked or it was cooked and then it was the dish itself was old. And the second I put it in my mouth, I was like, this chicken is bad. And I ate it and I was violently ill like 10 hours later. Like, you know, your body kind of knows when things are not right for you to eat. And For me, I mostly am able to tell chicken is cooked or not. I'm assuming we're talking either breasts or, you know, skillet thighs or even, I guess, a whole chicken. But the way that you can always tell is, uh, is there a pinkish fluid present? And also the opacity changes. A A cooked chicken breast will be opaque and a raw chicken breast will be sort of more translucent and pink. And so you're going from like pink and translucent to like white and opaque The texture changes, it goes from sort of squishy to firm. But I would say to you, if every time you do it and you're afraid and you go two minutes longer, I would just stop doing that. Just don't do that anymore. But also two minutes, you know, stopping cooking, letting it rest for two minutes, that feels good to me because there is heat carryover with chicken, with all protein, actually. It's kind of like an egg. Like if I'm boiling an egg and I want it like beautiful jammy yolks, I do like a six minute egg, sometimes a seven minute egg, and I pull it. And if I were to cut into it at that moment, it might be too runny for me. But letting it sit, because I don't believe in ice baths, letting it sit and carry over the heat, you're going to actually end up with the exact texture that you want. And the same goes for cooking meat and poultry. If you want to use a thermometer, you can. I've seen 160. And I think that like, if I was a person to use a thermometer, I would feel comfortable with that. That's not like a USDA rec. The USDA rec is 165. And that's at the deepest part where like a bone meets the thigh or the deepest part of the breast. But just like a, you know, any large piece of meat, it's very difficult to make sure that all the parts are cooking evenly. But yeah, and also just know that I've cooked a whole chicken before, taken it out, carved it, started to carve it and been like, oh, this needs more time. And then I just throw it back in the oven. So like, I'm not impervious to the mysteries of the poultry. I'm not safe from being like, oh, this should have gone longer. Or, oh, I wish I had taken it out sooner. Like the breast is a little dry. That happens to me too. But I think just through practice and like understanding what to look for, how it feels, how it looks. But 
I don't think that you're going to hurt anyone. TLDR. Hi, Allison. My name is Lean. I live in Berlin, but I'm Syrian and I'm a huge fan of you. And I owe you big time for getting me to finally eat anchovies only two years ago. And since then, I've been obsessed uh, with anchovies and I love to cook with them. But I noticed they don't always melt super well in oil and in sauces. My hunch tells me I might not be buying a good enough brand of anchovies, but I was wondering if there might be a reason for that. Like maybe the heat, um, like the oil is not hot enough or any other reason. Um, Yeah. Thank you. What a nice message. I have been asked this question several times and I think the only explanation I can think of is that like, yeah, your heat's not hot enough or you're not cooking them long enough because for me, I heat up oil in a skillet, medium high heat. I drop a few fillets in and almost immediately they just kind of like turn to mush. And the quality of anchovy is not necessarily going to really make a difference here because any salt cured anchovy packed in oil is going to dissolve in that way. There are anchovies that are like done in a sprat style that is more popular in uh, places like Sweden. And I don't know what they have in Germany. Our producer, Jen, could probably tell me more about that. But there could be a type of anchovy that's tinned over there that is more of like a, like a sprat style. And I have seen those and they're delicious on their own. as like a beautiful sort of like snack on a cracker, but they don't melt as well because of the way that they're uh, processed. But the typical, just like regular salt cured anchovy packed in oil should always dissolve. And if it's not, I would increase your heat a little bit. Sometimes you can use like a wooden spoon or something like that to kind of smash them into the oil, but they should just pretty effortlessly dissolve. So I would say more oil, hotter skillet, that should do the trick. Hi, Allison. This is Christopher Kane calling from Washington, D.C. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about MSG, which I found to be like the biggest flavor enhancer to my cooking since you taught me to start using anchovies and fish sauce. i uh, love to hear your thoughts. Uh, huge fan. Um, thanks so much. I love MSG. I think it's a fantastic ingredient. It makes things taste so good and like special and just fantastic. There's like, oftentimes I'll be at a restaurant. I'll be like, why does this taste so good? I'm like, oh, there's MSG in it. And like, it's not always where you expect it to be. Sometimes it's like cooked in something. Sometimes it's raw sprinkled on something. But I think a lot of chefs in restaurants especially, are pretty judicious with it. Like it doesn't necessarily need to go in everything. It's not like seasoning like salt, but when you use it, it can really like, like it just like is sort of in, in a, a true enhancement. And enhancement, as we know, wouldn't be an enhancement if it was in everything. So, you know, not to say that some restaurants don't feature it multiple places, but I think it's most special when used like judiciously. At Bonnie's in Brooklyn, their, their martini that they serve has MSG in it. And it's very, very, very good. Sort of like dirty martini vibes, but like juiced up to the nth degree. I, I, I can have exactly one of those, but it, it just is very good. But yeah, I'm a huge fan. I think it's great. I don't have it in my kitchen necessarily just because it's not an ingredient that I feel like most people have. But I have nothing against it. Full supporter. I think it's delicious. Love it. This episode of Solicited Advice is presented by Maker's Mark. When you think of Maker's Mark, you probably think of their iconic bottle with its perfect quirky shape, all dipped in that dripping red wax. As if that bottle couldn't get any more perfect, did you know that the first version of that signature red wax was stamped on that bottle by Maker's Mark co-founder Margie Samuels in her very own kitchen, in her home fryer? Iconic indeed. Maker's Mark brings their dedication to craft to everything they do today, including that same classic red wax on each bottle. Every bottle of Maker's Mark is hand-dipped before it finds its way onto shelves and to your home bar. And if you didn't think that was impressive, let's just say I did try to do this and I was terrible at it. So next time you're out and about, grab a bottle of Maker's Mark, handmade bourbon, and toast to doing things the hard way, like hand-dipping bottles and red wax. Because sometimes harder is better and because you care. Cheers. Maker's Mark makes their bourbon carefully, so please enjoy it that way. Maker's Mark Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, 45% alcohol by volume. Copyright 2023, Maker's Mark Distillery Incorporated, Loretto, Kentucky. Hi, Allison. 
Allison. My name is Lou Fed and I'm calling from Massachusetts. And I was wondering, um, I often like will have vegetables and I just feel like I'm placing them in the wrong places, maybe in the fridge or maybe on the counter. And I'm just not really sure where to place them to get them to, or really sort of extend their life for as long as possible. So can you please share with us your tips on like storing different groups of vegetables and how we can sort of maintain their freshness for as long as possible? Thank you. Bye-bye. You know, each refrigerator is very different. And this is like my my sort of like soapbox about ovens and like cooking in general. It's like my oven is not the same as your oven and my fridge is not the same as your fridge. I don't really believe in things like, oh, like put it in the crisper. Like I don't, it's not, I don't think that that is a good solve for most people because I don't trust a crisper. It's like humidity, no humidity, temperature control. I'm like, it feels too scary and I don't trust it. Most of my vegetables, like, my radishes, beets, turnips, rutabaga, potatoes. Well, I guess potatoes, I keep at room temperature. I would consider that a room temp vegetable. Go in like a drawer because they're heavy and they're, you know, on the lower level. Then it's like my leafy greens I store in Ziplocs or the bags that they come in. I do not wash them before I put them away because anything added moisture is going to wilt things quicker. It's going to sog them out. It's going to make them feel like that's where decay happens when there's moisture present. Another reason I don't trust the humidity function on a crisper. What else? Herbs, depending on the herb, I'll either keep them like with the stems trimmed and on my countertop or I will wrap them in moist paper towels. What else? What are other vegetables? Mushrooms? Don't last very long. Mushrooms, it's sort of like I cook, I buy only if I'm going to be cooking within the next 48 hours, basically, because they get wet, they get soggy, unless I'm like cooking them in a stew or a soup where like it doesn't really matter if they're just going to kind of continue to like be watery. But if I'm trying to like crisp them or use them in like a nice salad or something, I, I prefer them to be very fresh. You know, if I see celery going bad, that is like, I'm at half mast. I'm like, salute you, my friend, because it's one of my favorite vegetables and I hate going to waste. But what I'll do is if I see it on the decline, which is rare because I love celery as like a snack. So I'm eating it before it goes bad, but I will chop it up and put it in a Ziploc and put it in the freezer. So anything that's like going south, fennel bulb, celery, leeks, leek tops, I put in a Ziploc bag and I put in the freezer and I do make stock from it. I know it sounds very Martha Stewart circa 2004 to be like, save your vegetable scraps for a broth. But I do do that because again, I I have a real bee in the bonnet about food waste and I'm trying to do my part and like mitigate my own food waste by making sure that like fewer things go into the landfill, fewer things are being thrown away before they reach their full potential. I do realize when you make a stock, you end up straining that vegetable and throwing it away anyway. But what you're left with is like a beautiful, delicious something that you can then eat or use to cook with. So I consider it its purpose served. Hi, Allison. This is John from Tucson, Arizona. This is like hyper niche and it's more a comment than a question. This is a follow up to your turn up comments in the last episode. So I actually have a PhD in nutrition with a focus in cruciferous vegetables. And the glucosinolates that you talk about, those are actually these inert compounds in the cell wall. Not in the cell wall, but in the plant. But when you chop your turnip or any cruciferous vegetable, this enzyme called myrosinase gets released. And it cleaves off the glucose from the glucosinolate, and it releases this other compound or converts the glucosinolate into this other compound called an isothiocyanate. And that's actually what gives the spicy flavor. So when you cook it, essentially what you're doing is you're denaturing or deactivating that myrosinase enzyme. So when you eat everything else, damaging the cell wall doesn't create that isothiocyanate, so you don't get the spicy flavor. Wow. John, you're blowing my mind right now. More of a comment, less of a question, but... So glad that you called in. That's what this show is truly all about. And like I said, when the question was answered, it's like you could Google stuff, but I just really love to hear from a person that knows what they're talking about. And that's not me, not in that regard for that specific question. But thank you for explaining that in a way that was digestible, informative, and above all, entertaining. Hi, my name is Mary. I live in Denver, Colorado. One of the things I always struggle with is what to bring camping or on a hike want to elevate a little bit, not just kind of an almost snack. So I was wondering if you had any tips. Thank you. Wow. Someone's going hiking. That's beautiful. 
I don't believe in hiking snacks because I don't like carrying the food with me. It's too much stuff to carry. Then you're like all like out of breath and you're like, uh, this is like, I'm exhausted. I'd rather like eat before and eat after. But that said, I've gone on like very, very long hikes, like in Yosemite and like, or Yellowstone, wherever I was. But like, I packed like a kale frittata and it was more like picnic food that was like, okay, this is protein heavy. I can wrap it in foil. It's not going to get smushed. Like there's like fruit to snack on, nuts to snack on. I feel like anything that you can put in a Ziploc bag, anything that doesn't have any water in it. Like I don't really believe in like the sandwich packing. Cause like even I have a low tolerance for like the scent of old onion that's been like following me around on a hike or like warm tuna that's not intentionally warm. I don't want that. I think like a, a PB and J is chic. And I think that could be back in for hiking 2024. Um, that's my prediction. You heard it here first. And yeah, I don't know. I guess I just like simply don't go hiking enough. But that said, I I consider this to be like a transferable question for things like car rides and plane rides. And I believe in things like cut up celery sticks like a baby, but I love it. Second time I've mentioned celery this show. And hydrate. Don't forget to hydrate. Hi, Allison. This is Mariah from Washington State. Just wondering what you do with chicken hearts. Thank you. Bye. I fantasize about them. Yum, yum. Delish. I love chicken heart. I love chicken like anything. I love chicken liver. I love chicken hearts. I don't find myself cooking with them at home necessarily, but if they are on a menu, I will be ordering them. If they're like skewered and grilled, I think they're delicious. I think the texture is really cool. I don't have enough experience cooking them to feel confident, but I'm going to do a good job. To be honest, just laying it all out on the table here in a moment of vulnerability, but I do like to eat them. That's my answer. Hi, Allison. This is Esther from Queens, New York. I just wanted to know, how do you prevent veggies from flying everywhere when you're chopping? Thanks. That's never happened to me. I mean, if it has, I guess I just pick them up. Like, I don't, I don't know. T- take a breath. Take a breath. Calm, slow it down. Take, you know, think about what you're doing. <laughs> like, like, take a moment. Uh regroup. I also think that most people's cutting boards are simply too small. I think that people are cutting on a cutting board that is microscopic compared to what they should be using. Because if you're cutting a vegetable and it's flying everywhere, that means like your cutting board is not big enough to catch the vegetable. It also probably means that you're working too quickly and you should slow down. I have very, very dry skin and I also am 38. And I also hate taking care of my skin, if I'm honest. I feel like it takes up so much time and it's exhausting to me. So I am a less is more skincare routine person. And so when I first tried Cerebalm, I got it as a little free sample after my facial at Rescue Spa, my favorite place in New York to go. And I was just absolutely delighted in how easy it was to use, how good it made my skin feel, how multi-purpose the product was. And frankly, I am absolutely obsessed with it. And not just that, but now there's a toner that sort of has replaced my previous toner, which if you've been to Rescue Spa, maybe you know what it is. But it's also replaced my moisturizer. It's also replaced my makeup remover. I feel like I am fully on my way to having an actual routine, even if it's just the three steps. So grateful forever to Donna Sarah and specifically the Cerebalm. If you yourself are curious, you can go to donnasera.com and pick up a bottle. It comes in a very gorgeous, sleek little white package. And honestly, it would make a great gift to yourself or to somebody else who's even a little skincare curious. Hi, Allison. My name is Andrew calling from Pasadena, California. I have a question for you. I have particular friends who always consistently show up either right on time to parties or a little bit early. How do I tell those friends that it is actually rude to show up to a party early? Thanks. Looking forward to what you have to say. Bye. Okay. It's not rude if you call in advance because I had a Hanukkah party last week or two weeks ago and 50% of the guests were like, can I come at six when I said to come at seven? And I was just like, sure. Like, I was like, well, I'm not going to be ready. And nothing's going to be ready, but sure. And 
I think that for a person who is constantly trying to uh, maximize their time spent and like Tetris their schedule together, having like an hour where you're sort of killing time or like, you're just like, yeah, like, I don't want to kill time. Just come over. It really depends on how tight you are with the host and what kind of party, because this was like an intimate sort of nine person sit down. So to come early, I'm like, yeah, you can help. You can do whatever. But if this were like my ham party, like the big party, absolutely not. And I've told people, I was like, I honestly, I know myself. I'm running around. I'm not in a good mood, probably. (laughs) Like, please don't come early. But I think it's more rare to ask if you can come early during that time. It's super rude if you aren't that good of friends with the host. And it's super rude if you don't give them a heads up, I think. Hi, Allison. First of all, this is so much fun. I feel like I'm talking to you and I know you. My name is Margaret and I'm calling from Oklahoma. And I had a question about the rum pudding from Sweet Enough. And I tried to make it tonight. And the recipe says that you're supposed to whisk it for 15 to 18 minutes. But mine was coming together much quicker than that. And I'm wondering if I over whisked it because it was looking good, looking like it was turning into pudding, but it had only been like eight or nine minutes. And so I kept whisking it. And then when I added the butter um, rum mixture, it like kind of, I don't know, it wasn't combining no matter how much I would whisk it. And I just, kept whisking for a while. And essentially I feel like, I don't know. I feel like I fucked it up somehow because the butter is kind of just like sitting on top, not super incorporated, feeling like I need to try again. I put it in the fridge overnight, just hoping maybe it's going to magically fix itself. But I don't know if I just whisked it for too long. If I had the heat on too high, I have no idea what I did wrong. So yeah, if you have any advice, That would be great. Thanks. Okay. So this is deeply embarrassing. I, it's a very long story. You may recall earlier this year, I discovered there was a typo in the cookbook. It was from the lemon shortbread cookies. It was like the rest, the whole recipe was wrong. Like the, all the measurements on the, like, or actually like everything was incorrect except the sugar. And it was like half the amount of everything else. And something got lost deeply in translation. And it was a great shame in this house. (laughs) I'm still not quite over it, but I'm learning to live with the mistake. We have since reprinted the book and printed with the correct version. There's also the correct version on my website in a newsletter because so many people are making it and having an issue. This is the second time I have received this comment, but I investigate all comments about a recipe. If something works, if something doesn't work, and I looked into it and there is also a typo in this recipe. And it's not in the instructions. It is in the measurement for the cornstarch. It should be a quarter cup, not a half a cup. And that is a big difference, right? And just to sort of make sure I could sleep at night, I tried it with the full amount that's printed and it works. It just does cook sooner than you think. And the texture is like a bit thicker, but because the original version, the texture is like very, very just set, it's not like an unmitigated disaster. So I wasn't like freaking out the way I was with the shortbread, but it is a typo and it is half the amount of cornstarch. Um, So it's not you, it is the recipe. And it is really frustrating for me to make a mistake in a book because you can't fix it easily. And you have to tell everybody (laughs) that you've ever met that this exists. And even still, you're not gonna get to everybody. And it really does bother me to think of people in their home making something, taking the time, spending the money on the ingredients, you know, leap of faith that this is going to work because you trust me that it's going to. And when it doesn't, I feel so bad and I am deeply, deeply sorry. And it's so embarrassing. And, you know, I'm not here to like self-flagellate because mistakes do happen and books are very, very complicated to, you know, quality control and, and double check. Like there's so many people that look at it. There's so many moving parts. There's so many versions, the digital copies, the printed copies, you're making notes, you're changing things, you're whatever. It's like a very wild process. And with a savory book, it's very rare to have a mistake that's going to make or break a recipe. Like say I said two tablespoons of olive oil versus four tablespoons of olive oil. That is never going to give anybody like a really hard time in the kitchen. But with a baking book, it really, really matters, obviously. And so I'm sorry. (laughs) 
first of, first of all, to 2024 and fewer typos, spiritually and uh, literally. But for now, if you have Sweet Enough at home, which I hope you do, please go to your hot buttered rum page and cross out a half a cup of cornstarch and write in a quarter cup of cornstarch. I've had other people make it and they're like, it was great. And I'm like, okay, but it's, it's much better with the correct amount. And, uh, I'm sorry. I really am. Um, and if you are wanting to, you can also go to my website and print out a version of this recipe that you can print out and tape into your book that will match up with how the original lineup is. Same with the lemon shortbread. Um, free to everybody. It's just on my website, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I'm sorry. It sucks. I hate it. And uh, thank you for calling in and not just burning the book entirely. I really appreciate you. And I will say that it is much easier to make a podcast where there's no typos. And even if there were, you know what? We have an edit button for that. We could edit that right now. We could, this episode could be different tomorrow. We can hack into the mainframe and uh, do do our duty there. But it is uh, such a joy to have you listen every week. And we're so grateful that you made this a possibility And we're so excited to continue. And we're going to take a little break, take a little breather. January is going to be a quiet time for us, but we will be back and so excited to have you. And again, if you are listening and you'd like to contribute, if you'd like to call in, you can call our hotline at (laughs) 856-502-4816. Is that right? Ah, I can't believe I got it. Well, mostly you helped me. Yeah, or you can go to allisoneroman.com slash podcast and fill out the form for our more longer, in-depth uh, one-on-ones, as it were. Yeah, this is great. I love it. I am just very lucky. What a year What a year it's been. Jen, thank you so much for everything that you've done. Red, everything that you've done in your team. Yos for the music. Britt for the graphics. Elena for your assist with every person and logistical experience. And it's just been really nice. It's been... A dream, really. <laughs> and another thing, I am so, but I can never sign off. I've never signed off in my life. Thank you to everybody who listens and who has called in and been vulnerable and asked a question. And I am a huge fan of um, sharing information. And I think that not being afraid to ask a question is makes everybody smarter and everybody more empathetic and everybody just like a better person. So thank you. This episode is brought to you by Maker's Mark. Solicited Advice is hosted by me, Allison Roman. Our podcast is produced by Jennifer Sullivan with the help of Elena Rodriguez Villa. Technical production and editing is handled by Red Rock Music. And our theme music was created by Yosef Monroe. You can watch a video version of this podcast on my YouTube channel. And for questions, sponsorship inquiries, or anything else, please visit us at allisoneroman.com slash podcast. Podcast.